Welcome everyone to the Texas York Ride podcast. I'm Billy Hamilton and I have with me Tommy Chance Chapman, uh, Dr. Jim Rumsey, uh, most illustrious uh, Don Paul Payton, and we have a special guest with us today, which is the uh, past illustrious Grand Master of the Grand Council, Jerry Kirby. All right, thank you for joining us today. I'm glad to be here. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. So, uh, Jerry, the way this thing works, we have a couple of discussion questions that people have sent us or we have that we would like to ask you kind of break in first before we get to the good stuff. Uh, the first question we have, uh, what advice would you give someone who was thinking about making herself available to, uh, for a grand line? whether it be Grand Chapter, Grand Council, Grand Commandery, or Grand Lodge, what piece of advice would you give that person? First of all, they need to uh, uh, think about um, their financial situation uh, because uh, it's going to cost them a significant amount of money. They need to think about their, uh, their time situation uh, and if they're going to be able to devote the time necessary to uh, go around the state of Texas and not just running for the line, but going through the line. Uh, Cause um, you know, I, I, I did that this was, you know, 40 years ago uh, or pretty close to 40 years ago when I went through as grand master of the grand council, I actually, I was in the line in 80. So, that, that is 40 years ago. Uh, and uh, I probably went um, 60, 70,000 miles a year uh, at that time. Uh, I was fortunate that uh, I, I went somewhere, my, my family let me, uh, supported me to the, to the end that I could go at night almost every night or four times a week or five plus a weekends. Now, besides the financial part of it and the time part of it, uh, you must, the first thing probably you should do <laughs> is make sure you have the support of your family. And that's going to take a detailed discussion with your family of what being a grand officer requires or what we think it requires in the way of time and commitment. Uh, and I say when we think it requires, you know, you can go through and not do very much, but uh, if you want to be of service to the companions, and that's what being a grand officer is, is being of service to the companions, then it takes a strong commitment of time uh, away from your family. And also, there's gonna be times when you're gonna require your family to attend something that they wouldn't have attended if you weren't a grand officer. So uh, you, you need to, to look at the, uh, at the commitment that you're going to make. Uh, and it, it, you need to think about all the different things that, that you are committing to. Secondly, after the commitment, there needs to be a reason that you're running for office. It, you don't need to be running for office if you just want a title. You need to have something that you wish or you think needs to be done that will help the grand body as a whole. Uh, and if you don't, you're not out there to help the grand body as a whole, then what good are you? Uh, I, I, I admit that I'm old fashioned, but I think that, you know, you need, I, I think, what you what you the really the way I classify a grand officer is is that of a servant leader, and that you are trying to out there to help make our fraternity better by either 
getting the people that are already members to become more involved emotionally, intellectually, and physically to the point where they are committed to the organization. Uh, so that was the first thing that I would think about. Well, you, you said two things there that I, I didn't even know we had to, you needed to try to do. One was uh, have financial means to be able to run for a position <laughs> and then, <laughs> uh, or have an idea of what you want to do. I didn't know you, that was a requirement. <laughs> Well, I'm going to tell you what, uh, you know, I, I've been asked how much money I made uh, running for office, and, uh, you know, I never made any. It always cost me. So, uh, yeah. you know, I, I know sometimes that, you know, that we some really good people out there, they just can't afford to do it. Yes, sir. That's an important yeah. thing. Yeah. So, Jerry, you also serve as our grand recorder for the Green Commandery, in addition to being the past grand of all the all four of the uh, presiding office uh, grand offices in texas york right bodies um with that in mind in the current state of things with the covid19 virus um we obviously have a higher average age of membership in texas and with all that in mind do you think our grand bodies uh, should look into options to do the virtual voting that some other states are uh, looking at for legislation and election of the grand officers instead of having uh, in-person meetings, not only this year, but going forward. Uh, we, of course, grand commander is being affected by this right now, but you know, this could last for, for months and months for as far as we know. So could affect grand chapter and council, grand lodge in the future. So is that something that you think we should be considering going forward for all the grand bodies? Well, you know, I, uh, I, I'm reading and listening to all the people talk about the coronavirus, COVID-19. And the dog wanted to listen to one of the doctors the other day. And he said, you know, that we're having a really bad because nobody is, is uh, used to this particular strain of the, of it. And that, uh, as we go around and people get, you, it, it will evolve and become a weaker disease in the future. So, you know, I, I don't know whether it's going to be um, a uh, forever situation about the, uh, uh, where we can't get together or not. I'm hopeful that that's not going to be the situation from now on. I'm, I, I think into the, in our situation right now, we, we need to be able to do something so that we can have uh, our meeting, do our elections, vote on legislation. I'm not sure how we can verify that we have legal voters voting. That's my mm -hmm. problem right there, because uh, you know it's going to be hard to determine uh, who's who's voting uh, and who's not voting, and if they are a uh, member of the Grand Commander, which means they're either a dice officer or a you know a past past commander. So I, I I don't know how to do that. I, I'm not sure that we uh, if we had. Um, and the thing about it is, in determining that somebody is a legal voter, uh, how do we maintain the secret ballot also? See, that's... Uh, yeah, that's important. Yeah, it's important, and uh, I, I'm not sure how, how we can do that. We could get, we could have somebody stand up and on a screen like this, and somebody... <laughs> I hate to say this, because... I said, Dad, I'm old, uh, but I, I know most of the people. And so yeah. we, we could have people, the commanders, and they could, they could tell us everybody from their commanders, but then we would know how that person voted also. So I, I don't know. I don't know how to do it. Uh, if we could find a way to do it, 
I, I think that would be good because we could uh, just uh, go on this kind of a situation and uh, and do do the legislation and the reports that are necessary and then uh, start over on the current year with an election. That's, that's all I got. Uh, thanks, Jerry. Uh, this next one is a, uh, it's a true discussion question and it's for everybody here, not just for Jerry. Uh, recently, uh, the Grand Master of Masons in Texas has prohibited all stated and called meetings of Texas lodges and gatherings of Masons in excess of 10 persons. Uh, this prohibition obviously cannot uh, apply to employers or employer, 10 or more Masons are employed at work together. Uh, it can't apply to public or private uh, businesses or groups. Uh, if the Grand Council uh, of Royal and Select Masters of Texas is truly a sovereign entity, and the Grand Master decision cannot apply to private or public businesses, how does this apply to the York Rite of Freemason? Well, I'm gonna tell you what I, what I think. I, I'm gonna think that uh, the Grand Master, uh, we have a, a situation where we have a foundation and each succeeding body is built on top of the one in front of it. We have the Grand Lodge and then we have the Grand Chapter and then the Grand Council and then the Grand Commandery and so forth. Uh, but all of the people that belong to the Grand Council are also master masons and under and if they can't meet as masons that automatically takes them out as a, a council it has nothing to do with the grand council being a sovereign body but because those people even though they're members of the council they are still master masons and they're still subject to the grand master's rules so that's i agree with that and i think uh, when the law on an independent body is silent it falls to the Grand Lodge law. And as we all know, the Grand Master of the Grand Lodge is the ultimate say uh, when it comes to the law when the Grand Lodge is not in session. So what he says goes for everyone, really. No, I'd be in agreement with that too, right? It's, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, um, we all are dependent upon recognition from the Grand Lodge, right? Without Grand Lodge recognition, you know, the other Masonic bodies can't necessarily function. So. They don't function at all. Yeah, if they're not, <laughs> what's that? There's an article number that says if they're not recognizing that article number, then they they can't use uh, Masonic lodges. Can't exist. So, we'll, so you know, we had an organization. I'm not going to see what it is, but uh, we've had a couple of organizations that the Grand Masters have removed from uh and they can, they can no longer operate in texas so yeah it, it the thing about it is is even though you're a member of that other organizations and it's sovereign you're also a member of the grand lodge everybody is a member of the grand lodge and so if you can't do it from the foundation that the other ones are not uh you know that you can do things that are not in conflict with the Grand Lodge, but you can't do things that are in conflict with the Grand Lodge. John Paul, you, you got a comment on it? <laughs> Grand Master? <laughs> well, I'm sitting here going through my mind how to answer this question. Uh, English would be preferred. <laughs> this would be a great question to ask uh, Grand Master Underwood right now. Um, I, I, I agree with uh, everybody. Um, chances, chances saying and uh, Jerry's and Billy's, you got to be a master mason before you can join the chapter and council and commander and so forth. But Jim, uh, you always have pretty good questions, and there's always a backside to every question you're asking. Uh, <laughs> whether uh, with in reference to this question, let me scroll back up there to it. Uh, if the Grand Council of the Royal Site Master of Texas is a sovereign body and the Grand Master's decision cannot apply to private or public businesses, how does it apply to the York Rite of Formation? 
That's a very good question. And I would defer that to Paul Underwood right now. So uh, <laughs> we would let him answer that. So technically, that is the answer, right? <laughs> yeah. That is the answer. There you go, Bill. Hey, Jim, question. Uh, question for you. What is your answer? What do you think? What's your feelings on that question? I am the poser of the question, not the answer <laughs> to the question. <laughs> if you knew the answer, you wouldn't ask, right? I, I saw that question. I'm like, damn, uh, man, that's a tough one right there. That's a good question. If I had a little bit more time for, to prepare between one and five o'clock today and thought about it and made a couple of phone calls, I would have a good answer for you. I've got a follow up question. Can the Grand Master of the Grand Council wear his apron to a Blue Lodge meeting? <laughs> uh, you want my answer right now? Is that about your it. trivia question? It is. <laughs> hey, as, as I've been told by most past Grand Masters of the Grand Council, let me talk to the jurisprudence committee and I will get you an answer and get back to you. <laughs> All right. So my question <laughs> is, uh, uh, with uh, one of the unexpected things that has popped up is that there's a lot more online education that's available uh, through different Masonic Facebook groups or what have you. And uh, my question is, what are your thoughts on the brethren using this online education, online meetings uh, in the absence of being able to hold regular meetings? What are your thoughts on it? I, well, you know, the thing about it is, is I think it's a good thing. Uh, so, cause it sort of keeps us, uh, thinking about the masonry when we can't go and where you know and I've, I've definitely got a uh what is it a void in my life where for the last uh, 50 couple 52 years i've been going to masonic meetings and regularly and now i'm not and so i'm missing that so but the thing about it is is there are if you understand that in our fraternity that believe it or not i am not the oldest person in the fraternity there's people older than me and they're like me they're not on you know i got on facebook last week because our church is doing their 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 sunday sermons on facebook i wasn't on facebook and so a lot of these things that they're going are i'm not on twitter i'm i may not even know what all they call them but so a lot of people that are not are missing it because it's not reaching them because a lot of us older people are not up to date with the newest communication methods that are available to us through the computer because we're not knowledgeable. Uh, and I, I think it would be good, but uh, you know, I'm gonna need some help before I get to, before, before I can do it. I needed lots of help to get available today. <laughs> Thank you, Billy. Well, and you know, what's interesting though is Facebook, believe it or not, the youngest generations uh, that we're appealing to now, the millennials and the Zoomers. Facebook, a lot of them consider that the old man's social media. Uh, you know. <laughs> so, and, and, you know, we did a study at the last company I worked for, and it's like, yeah, Facebook, that's my dad's, you know, social media app. Um, you know, a lot of them are now way beyond that, you know, and uh, you're doing TikTok, mm -hmm. you know, stuff like that. And uh, DP, though, has actually started on TikTok, so we may have a Grand Master's message coming soon via TikTok. So it'll be a short oh, message. Oh, goodness. I think it's coming. I think it's coming. I know what that is. <laughs> you, you don't want to know, Grand Master. <laughs> Jerry, I don't either. And the thing about it is, what, what the, the younger guys are considering old is probably people about the age of my son. You know? <laughs> You know, like <laughs> stage, you know. Well, yeah, yeah. my DP is old. Oh, yeah. 
things, right? One example is is my son, right? He's he's a brand new master mason, but uh, you know he uses Facebook because that's what other groups use. But when he's doing personal communication, that's not right. So like when he meets, you know, a new person, uh, and, and I listen to him, and they're like, "Hey, what's your snap?" You know, and because yeah. they're on Snapchat, they're not on on Facebook. Man. Snapchat and Instagram, those are the ones I use. So. Snapchat and what? Instagram. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I I have no, I don't have either one of those. I can tell you that. Yeah. Oh, well, neither do I. I guess that makes me old. Well, this leads right into our next part of the uh, interview here. Uh, a brief uh, Masonic bio of Jerry Kirby, and I'll help you out there since you've got so many pages of stuff on here. Uh, looking at it right now, entered. Uh, Initiated in January 13th, 1968, uh, passed in March, and then raised Master Mason April the 13th in 1968. Well, Jerry, uh, I have a 68 Plymouth Roadrunner that's about the same, <laughs> that is the same age as you. It was made. I remember those cars. <laughs> January 26th of 68, but. Uh, You've got, you served uh, Nash Lodge, uh, been an officer in Nash Lodge for 40 some odd consecutive years. 52. 52, okay. <laughs> 52 consecutive years. Uh, received a Mark Master degree in 1969, uh, Royal Arts degree also, served as high priest 69 and 70, a Midlothian chapter number 211, Dallas chapter. Love Field Chapter, uh, served as District Deputy Grand High Priest, 1971. Who was the Grand High Priest in 1971? Well, Nathaniel Bird Gafford, who was a, a, a chiro orthopedic chiropractor from Sulphur Springs. Sulphur Springs, Texas. There you go. Nathaniel Bird Gafford. Says here, uh, I'm reading as, this, as we go through. Of course, uh, Thrush Illustrious Master, also 69 through 70, and District Deputy Grand Master of Crypt District number 18 in 1974. For who was Grand Master in 1974? Robert Hardy Hall. <laughs> All right. And then, of course, you were a past commander. You were knighted in uh, June of 1969 in, I can't even. Bertrand de Goslin, Commandery Number Fourteen. Where was that? Of course, Canada. It's still there. Really? Okay. Is it the same? It's something else, isn't it? Or is that the name? <laughs> no, that's it. Bertrand de Goslin. Really? Was there not one in uh, in Dallas? What made what? you? Join what made you join Corsicana? Well, uh, we joined Corsicana because it was. I lived in Avalon at the time, and it was probably the closest. Well, uh, I don't want to go into what happened to Waxahachie Commandery Number Seventy One, because it had just been uh, merged with Tankred, and it was a situation where there was a lot of uh, hurt feelings. Sure. And so uh, my dad. Uh, was a member at uh, Corsicana, so that's where I went to Corsicana. So you, you were eminent commander in 1973. In Hillsborough. In Hillsborough, that's right. And of I, well, they changed the night that they met to my regular stated meeting for Lodge, so I transferred to Hillsborough because I couldn't go to Corsicana because it was the same night as my Lodge meeting. So I transferred over to Hillsborough. I went through the line and was commander in 73. You, and were elected the Grand Junior Warden of the Grand Lodge December 7th of 2013. Do you remember that day vividly? I remember it because there was an ice storm that hit uh, North Texas. Remember that? Oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, listen, we had... Uh, we we had about uh, what thirty or forty percent of the total people that are usually there at Grand Lodge. Yeah, I, I was uh, I was a little worried because I thought my the people that were supporting me from North Texas and West Texas 
weren't there. And, and then, of course, uh, elected and installed Grand Master 2017 of the Gr Most Worshipful Grand Lodge of Texas. And like I said, you are belong to so many appendant bodies and other, <clears throat> of course, uh, Scottish Rite, everything. We could be in here for days talking about all this stuff. But this goes right into the first question. In 1982, you were a district deputy Grand Master of the Grand Lodge for one of our really, really good friends that we think a lot of, uh, Jimmy Double L. Wilson, out of Floyd Data, Texas, up there in God's country. You know, kind of by Hall County, you go to Floyd County. Uh, I've been there. <laughs> so, Jimmy Wilson, 19, <clears throat> 1982, it was you, uh, Grand Master, past Grand Master Reese Harrison Jr., Mike Gower, Walter. Walt Rogers, and then uh, looking through that list, I see uh, 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 Bill Blanks was a district deputy for Jimmy, uh, Joe Schriever. Uh, there's quite a few uh, guys that went through other Grand Lines, not just the Grand Lines, but other Grand Lines. And uh, Well, uh, if I can interrupt you, I'll tell you that out of Jimmy's Grand family, district deputies and Grand Officers, Nine people since then have come and gone through the Grand Lodge line. I was the ninth. So this, that goes into the question. Uh, you were before Jimmy in the Grand Council. You yeah, were, well, actually, yes, I was. You were Grand Master in 1983. So in 1983, Jerry, I was four years old. Just want you to know that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, Jimmy followed you in 1987, and you had uh, 1987, you know, you had Jimmy, then you had Joe Schriever, then Burton, Bartlett out of Lubbock, and all them guys. But uh, a lot of guys, I was talking to past Grandmaster just yesterday about the things that Jimmy did for Masons in Texas, him and Furman and those guys like that. And a lot of the younger Masons, uh, that are new to masonry have no idea what jimmy was and what he did so the question is what did jimmy do for you and do for the masons of texas jimmy wilson uh i'll go back to 1973 when you said i was commander yes uh, uh jimmy wilson was installed grand commander that year of the grand commander so i was uh a, grand, a commander when Jimmy was grand commander. Uh, and uh, he, I got to go in regularly. We went regularly to the uh, York Rack Conference that they always had in Floyd Data. Uh, Jimmy was, a, a, for me, in my opinion, I think he's the greatest grandmaster that I've ever known. Okay, so that's what I think about Jimmy. He, he, he was he wasn't a great ritualist. The ritual was not really, but he was one of the smartest men around and a great administrator, and he was absolutely uh, one of the best people around. His character, his moral quality, was just unquestioned. Uh, he did things for people without getting, uh, without wanting anybody else to know about it. He did a lot of things for a lot of people. And I was fairly active in that time. And uh, Jimmy did some things uh, uh, with his district deputies. Jimmy was the first Grand Master to have district deputy training. And we trained, he trained us, and then we were the first ones to have, the, we went and visited the lodges twice. And he, he did a lot of things, uh, uh, he had a lot of things that he instigated, and some of them he instigated through other people, so people <laughs> know that he did it, but he was a, he was a, a wonderful beacon of light in the Masonic fraternity. Uh, he, uh, his, his family uh, supported him. Uh, Anne was a wonderful support to him. Uh, and uh, I have, uh, uh, 
I have a lot of things I could tell you about Jimmy. Uh, I will tell you that when he died, his oldest son sent me about six boxes of Jimmy's personal letters and effects. Right. And uh, and I've read some of those things that I don't think they're for public use, but uh, it just re invigorated my uh, respect for the man. I, I've given some, sent some of them to the library. I was telling a story the other day about Jimmy. We was, whenever Kitty Quay Lodge, I was a member of Kitty Quay Lodge up there in God's country in Briscoe County, uh, 1248. And we'd have about, oh, six, seven guys come to stated meetings. You know, great lodge, everybody cared about everybody and so forth. But you always knew when the boys were coming into town because it was Jimmy and all his group, and there's about 50 other guys show up in Kitty Quay, Texas that night. So <laughs> it was good times. Go ahead, Jim. Jerry, uh, you were Grandmaster of the Grand Council in 1983. 82, 83. Don That's Paul cool. was four. I was in kindergarten. So the question for you is, just looking at the Grand Council, What's different today compared to 1983? Well, one thing is the number of members. You know, uh, I, I'm trying to remember uh, how many we had that back then. It was uh, 35,000. 35,000. Yeah, I was. I wanted to say 30, even I didn't want to feel, feel like I was right, but 35,000 members. Uh, it. The Grand Council then was uh, it was uh, it was not easy to get into the line. Uh, there's three or four people that would run. It was it was uh, uh, a great uh, uh, hard to get elected into the committee on work. Uh, there was always three or four people who were really working and working hard to get elected into the committee on work uh, and. Uh, there were people that made commitment. We had the school. We would have two or three hundred people at the school of instruction that ran six days, and uh, they it would go. We have a morning session and the evening session, and then a night session, and all the rooms were full uh, all day long and at night for all six days. Uh, it was uh, we. People would go out to, just starting. It was it already come down some now, uh, but you know we had the really big uh, things when we had a lot of people being initiated in the '60s. But that had slowed down a good bit to the to the in the '70s. But uh, we we worked we worked hard. Uh, at that time, and there were a lot of degrees that were that were done because a lot of degrees were done not in festivals but individually. You had a lot of the chapters, councils. Uh, you know, my dad and I, we would go, we would go to Hillsboro, we'd go to uh, Middle Oak, and of course we had we were at Waxahachie, we'd go to Ennis, uh, we, we'd go all over the place and. Since Dad was on the committee on work in the chapter and council, then uh, I, I had to learn and get a certificate early. Uh, so that was, we got to go out and we, do, we got to do a lot of work. We got to lead a, a, a lot of, uh, a lot of people. So I'm just, I just think it's just the numbers and, and people were more committed at that time. All right, Jerry, that goes into the next question for you. Uh, so your dad, Herbert Kirby, served for the Grand Chapter and the Grand Council for the Committee on Work for many, many years. Fifteen years. Fifteen years. And back, in, back when their chapter and councils were going strong and we had, you know, thousands and thousands of members, uh, what can you tell us about your dad? Yeah, you don't have enough time. <laughs> I my dad was the, the greatest person I've ever known. Uh, Masonically, 
he he was a wonderful ritualist uh, because he had he had knew the blue lodge the chapter and council uh he did, there was nobody that knew uh the council work better than dad in fact when they finally voted to go to a code book my uh, the rest of the committee sat around and my dad said the work and that's how they did the code book. And he said it without a mistake. And that's 47,000 words. And all the rest of them got, were sitting there and they said, well, I know it, but I could see it without having to go back. He never had to go back. He just said it. Which, right. I, you know, I was pretty impressed. <laughs> I, and I thought I knew it pretty well, too. But I, I did not know that. Um, that's the first time I've ever heard that, but I've heard Reese Harrison speak about your dad and all the years you and he mm -hmm. have gone to Grand Chapter Grand Council session. Uh, I know uh, Pastor and Master Harrison, he thought a lot of your dad. Well, my dad, uh, a lot of people, they, there were a lot of people that wanted him to run for the grand office, and he said, no, he'd rather be on the committee on work. But, uh, he, you know, he wouldn't give me a certificate. Yeah, he, he said, he said, I told him, I said, well, I need to stand up for visions. He said, well, you, you got to get one of the other members of the committee of work. I ain't going to have them say that Herbert gave his, gave his boy a certificate. <laughs> In those days, you didn't get a certificate by just going to the school. You had to say every word of it. So he made the other four committee men listen to me, and I said the chapter and the council and got a certificate. There you go. Golly, that's a full day right there. <laughs> Absolutely. That was in 1969. Well, so Jerry, you're one of the very select few men in Texas to have served as the presiding officer of all the four York Wright bodies, uh, Grand Lodge, Grand Chapter, Grand Council, and Grand Commandry. Uh, in your opinion, which one was the hardest and which one was the most enjoyable? Well, yeah. <laughs> Grand Lodge is the hardest. Yeah, it's, it's uh, I, you know, even even at these times where there's you know, you know, I think it was eighty some odd thousand or when I was a grandmaster, and it's and it's it's a uh, it's big business, uh, and uh, I was fortunate having been a school superintendent and my forte was finance which helped me a lot uh but you know it's a big business uh, and you got to be able to uh, do a lot of things and it was it was the hardest and it's it's day in and day out uh, the one i enjoyed the most was grand commandery because that's like family yeah and uh, and and it, it goes along with my religious beliefs and that's uh uh so i like the grand commandery was the the one i enjoyed the most but at grand lodge was uh, it was the hardest but in in a way it was one of the most rewarding also yeah that's how dad describes it as well uh, of course he's been the grandmaster grand lodge grand high priest and grandmaster of the grand council and he said the same thing you know, Grand Lodge is definitely way different than the others, uh, but it it's very difficult, but it's very, very rewarding, uh, especially with all the brothers throughout the state that uh, yeah. they, they offer up so much of themselves to help the Grand Master in so many ways. Uh, I was privileged to be one of your district deputies in 2017, so uh, just full disclosure, I'm a little biased. <laughs> I'm a little biased to you. <laughs> and of course, our families have been intertwined for many decades. So, uh, your, your grandfather and my father were close friends. Oh, absolutely. So we started way back. Yeah. So, um, can you tell us why you chose to uh, pursue the Grand Council first out of the four bodies? Uh, if I remember right, you're the youngest that's ever served as Grand Master of the Grand Council being 36, I think, um, at the time. So what made you decide to do it first and at that age? 
Well, uh, I was I was fortunate that I went through. Uh, I was a thrice illustrious master. It walks it actually. You're reading it in, in my bio. It says Middle Ocean, but actually, Walks the Hatchie Council merged with Middle Ocean. I was actually the uh, thrice illustrious master of Walks the Hatchie Council, and I went through so early, so quick uh, that. Uh, if you look at the people that run for grand council, they've been a past thrice illustrious master, probably averaging six or seven years. I had been a past thrice illustrious master for thirteen years when I was uh, installed. When I was installed as grand master, uh, I was active uh, in uh, all the uh, the bodies. I mean, active. I'd been district deputy. I was uh, uh, had been appointed uh, grand conductor of the council. I'd been uh, appointed grand captain of the guards. I'd served, and uh, and having gone to grand lodge and grand chapter and grand council every year since I came in, uh, then I was. Uh, I noticed that there were people that were talking. Uh, Reese and <laughs> and I were some of the younger ones, uh, and you stood out. And some of the old, the people talked to you, and uh, there were several that said we had a sort of a lull, I guess, and nobody was really running. And uh, so some some several of them come to me and ask me, said, "Would we want you to run for grand council?" So I ran. And nobody else ran. I ran unopposed. Oh wow, that's big. I, well, now it's some of you may not know. I'm the only person in history to have been run unopposed for grand council, grand chapter, and grand commander. Wow, I never, I never had an opponent. I was that may be the reason I made it because I could may not have been beat anybody. <laughs> But uh, wow. I, I, that's, they, I, I was basically asked to run, and then somebody asked me to run uh, for green uh, chapter, and then I forgot who died. Willie Joe died. And I ran, mm. they asked me to run. That thing. Okay. Uh, last question I have for you is um, you're obviously very passionate about the York Wright uh, aspect of masonry. What fuels that passion? Uh, well, I love all Masonic stuff. I you realize I was I grew up. Uh, I, my son is the seventh consecutive generation uh, to be a Mason, and and in my home lodge, thirty four members of my family have belonged to that lodge. So, uh, my son is the seventh generation on my dad's side, the fifth on my mother's side, and so we've just sort of grown into it. And, and so the thing about it is, is uh, I like I like the Scottish rap, but the York rap fits my religious beliefs better, and so uh, I, I like that. That's one of the reasons. And my dad was uh, active in the York rap. Uh, he was not a member of the Scottish rap, but he was active in the York rap, and so that's. Uh, and for the first several years, uh, my dad and I went to a lot of things together. And that was that was why I went there. If if you don't mind, I have a couple of quick questions for you. Um, the first one is, having been involved in so much masonically, uh, what is the one honor that stands out most to you? Oh gosh, I don't know. Uh, uh, mm. You know, I you know I don't know. Uh, probably being elected Grand Master of the Grand Lodge. Ah, uh, that is a a singular event, uh, and uh, and you are chosen as a leader among leaders. 
Uh, so yeah, that I guess that would probably be it. All right, and I mean that definitely makes sense. I mean, it's such a huge title, especially here in Texas, right? It carries a huge history with it. Uh, the next question I have is, what would your advice be for someone who is interested in telling someone who doesn't know anything about masonry what masonry is? In, in short, what is your 30-second elevator speech that you would give to someone who's not familiar with who we are and what we it, do? You know, I, I can't even tell my name in five minutes. What are you talking about? I, I don't have really, a, I know that some of them have the 30 seconds, uh, Tommy has one, but uh, my 30 second speech would go into a two or three minutes, but I tell them basically what masonry is about, what it does, what kind of organization it is, that we do things for people. I tell them about our charities and I tell them that it is to make you it will make you a better man it's not a religion but it's religious in nature and if you you know you want to be a better person masonry will help you do it it becomes a way of life that's what i that's how i tell them that's what right. I do. excellent thank you well jerry uh of course you know i like history i like listening to old stories about what went on back in the day with this and that and, uh about a month ago we lost a good friend of all of ours orville o'neill passed away and i know you and orville traveled the state of texas with uh, there was a bunch of y'all that rode around in a van and uh i've heard some of those stories and some of them we probably can't talk about on here for everybody to hear but uh, <laughs> What is one story you would like to tell somebody about one of those trips when y'all were on that, in that van, like a bunch of grown men riding around in a white van? That just doesn't sound right today, but. Uh, <laughs> well, I tell you, that was our uh, Alexander C. Garrett uh, ritual team. We would go and, and, and confer the commandery orders and we've conferred them from Brownsville to Texline and from El Paso to Texarkana. We have conferred them all over the state. And, we, and I don't know, Arvel and I probably went 50, 60,000 miles down the road together, probably more than that, I don't know, for years. Uh, and, you know, if you're in the commandery, there's one of the things that was funny is we were uh, putting on the Order of the Red Cross that there's a banquet scene and in Garrett, we 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 had fun with it. And they had the wine glasses, and we brought this candidate up there, and we sat him down. And and uh, Orville took a Bowie knife, genuine Bowie knife, and popped the top off of a of a banana, peeled it back, stuck it in the wine, and then ate it. He looked over at the guy, and he said, "That's how you eat that stuff." And he looked at him and he looked at me and he looked at Alan Rowe and he said, no wonder he looks like that. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm telling you, the entire room broke apart and we laughed and we laughed and we laughed. And, uh, you know, um, it took us about five or six minutes to get back in order and finish the degree. But I've seen that guy five or six times. He says, you remember that time in Paris? And he says, he says, I said, were you that guy? And he said, yeah. And he says, I still remember. He, he's still dedicated. I said, but Arvel, I'm going to tell you one thing about him. When I was commander, he was the generalissimo. We're at inspection, and we're supposed to start at 730, and it's 726, and he's not even there yet. He walks in at 727, he looks at me, he's got his uniform home and everything, he says, worried. <laughs> I could have killed him, but he was laughing. But, uh, you know, he, he liked to pull pranks, but he loved masonry and he loved masons. And it's a great loss. Those are great stories, Jerry. I think we all share uh, 
uh, a little bit of our, our heart, hearts are a little bit uh, heavy with the passing of Orville. He was a good friend of many people. And I, Don Paul's right. He did love this fraternity uh, more than a lot of us can comprehend. Uh, Jerry, uh, you and I, you may not remember this, but I do. We got to know each other whenever you were making yourself available for the Grand Junior Warden spot. And the first time I remember having a, a friendly conversation with you one-on-one, -on -one, uh, you came out to Marshall, Texas for an MWSA meeting whenever I was president of the MWSA out in East Texas. Uh, since then, we've developed what I call a, a friendship. Uh, more than just being masonically connected, we've become friends. And I appreciate that. And I appreciate you giving all of us your time this evening to come on this, this video cast or podcast. Uh, do you have any closing thoughts or any questions you'd like to ask us at this time before we wrap this up? No, I don't have any, I don't have any questions. I just would like to say this, you know, um, uh, I joined the fraternity because my family have done, and I've been a member 52 years, and it has been the greatest thing for me in my life to help me become a better person. It has become a way of life for me, and uh, this uh, virus has <laughs> taken a lot of it away, and I miss that. I miss my friends. I miss my brothers, my Masonic family. So God bless you all. Thank you, Pastor Grandmaster. Uh, I think we're about ready to wrap it up. Uh, the quote of the week uh, comes to us this week from Carl Sagan. And I want everyone who's looked at my uh, uh, Committee on Work trivia questions and think about those while I read this quote to you. And also think about what's going on in the world right now uh, with the news media. And the quote is, the truth may be puzzling. It may take some work to grapple with. It may be counterintuitive. It may contradict deeply held prejudices. It may not be consistent with what we desperately want to be true. But our preferences do not determine the truth or what is true. That's, once again, Carl Sagan. Very true. Well, guys, it's, uh, it's been a heck of a good podcast. Of course, uh, Jerry's always been a good friend of mine, and uh, he's done a lot for me, and I appreciate that more than he ever will ever know, I guarantee. I haven't done anything. <laughs> uh, so if anybody listening to this or watching this, if you have any questions for us or some of our guests, be sure to email us at chat at yourcrytexas.org. That's C-H-A-T at yourcrytexas.org. And uh, Jerry, those stories about Orville and your dad and guys like that, you need to keep telling those stories. and That way we all know about it. Uh, it, and I'm ready to get back out and seeing people and seeing you out and uh, get you to come back out here to Parker County. You've been out here several times, of course, but uh, now that you live a little bit closer, uh, it should be a shorter drive. But uh, I want to thank you for taking your time out of your day for doing this for us and uh, look forward to see you down the road. It's my pleasure. Thanks for asking me. Excellent. Well, it's been a fantastic conversation, and uh, I believe that uh, comes to the end of our podcast. So thank you, everyone, for joining, and uh, we'll have another one out uh, in about a week. All right. Y'all have a good Easter. All right. All right. Thank, thank you, everyone. Happy, Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everybody. <laughs>